Good morning, intimidatingly brilliant people. <laughs> um, so I was going to talk about how ideas emerge as people collide in intentional spaces. But idea creation is just one part of a much broader, much more exciting whole. Something bigger is very much more at play. Ideas emerge as vibrant communities form. I co-founded a space called Impact Hub Seattle, an abandoned furniture store in Pioneer Square. We sell three things, shared workspace, event venue rental, and private office space. But like the whole idea, community, chicken egg conundrum, the real product we offer is community. We deliver facilitated introductions and educational programming to our 500 members on a daily basis. We weren't in the business of creating ideas. We are in the business of growing a community. Ideas are simply one diverse outcome of a community. So instead of talking about outcomes today, I want to talk about the cause. You're going to walk away from this talk with the tools that you need to grow vibrant communities to solve the many different social issues that we have in front of us today. When we first started Hub, we wanted to create the largest community of change makers in the entire world. We, we believe that communities are key to solving the big social issues that are in front of us today. This is because communities create a culture, and culture facilitates that individual behavioral change that is so important to creating long-term uh, sustainable change from a bottom-up approach. Not only that, but community is a fundamental principle of life. You all know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We need food, water, shelter, in order to be able to even think about our neighbor and the bigger ideas in front of us. But along the same lines, we need to feel safe. In strong communities, people feel safe to share their opinions and ideas, which lead to generative, behavioral changing conversation. As humans, we're very multifaceted creatures. We have many different identities. For example, I myself identify as an American, a female, an entrepreneur, and probably a lot of other things. When I feel like one part of that identity is in the minority, I'm going to hold on to that part of, my, part of my identity more so than the other parts. If I'm in a room full of males, for example, I might hold on to that aspect of my femininity more than anything else. So think about if one, part of that, if one aspect of my identity is, is under attack. I'm going to even hold on to that part of my identity even more so than any other part of my identity. I would need to feel safe and valued in order to think broadly, more broadly, in order to talk about part of that part of myself that's really close to who I am. So, communities directly aid a base level human need to feel safe. And from that safety, people are able to overlook parts of their identity that they may otherwise hold on to in order to have big, important conversations about big challenges facing us today. So, before we move on, let's define what community actually means. To us, community, we define community as a group of like-minded, individually successful people with a coherent vision, dedicated to growing the success of its core. I'm guessing since, this, since you're all attending this event, you've probably heard the buzzword community thrown around quite a bit. And I'm guessing that you probably also have a pretty altruistic connotation to what community actually means. Well, I'm here to tell you that community is in no way, shape, or form altruistic. You create a vibrant community by creating highly successful individuals. Each individual in a community is mostly focused on their own advancement. We automatically think of our own success first. It's just the way that we are. It's not a bad thing, but you have to take that into account when thinking about building a community. You need to first focus on helping to grow that individual so that they, in turn, reinvest back into the community. For example, we do intake interviews with all of our members when they come into the space. Just a really simple um, you know, 10 to 15 minute interview where we talk about who they are, why they're here, what they're working on. About 80% of the members that I talk to say the exact same thing. I'm sick of working from home, I'm tired of wearing my pajamas all day, I want to come into work, I'm tired of talking to my dog. People join the hub because they think that they need office space. They're super invested in their idea, they've been working on it for a while, it's really all about them. But when they finally do join the hub, they end up staying because of the relationships that they create that help them grow their purpose. Take Nason, for example. Nason was running a business where he sold art from the developing world online on the first, and he also did some client work on the side. Nason joined the hub because he was working from home all the time. 
He joined the hub with that specific goal in mind. He kept to himself for a few weeks, mostly just kind of surprised at the insane amount of productivity he had just by getting dressed and coming into a, a work every day. After a couple of weeks, though, he started chatting with some other members at our Thursday lunch. He met a few people. One of those people was Jay, who was working on an educational technology startup. They became friends and went out to lunch a couple of times. Another one of those people was Matt. Uh, Matt was a freelance graphic designer. They commiserated, they commiserated on were dealing with clients together. And finally, he met Mark, who was running an adventure travel volunteerism company, and they just talked about their shared experiences when they had both been living in Chile at the same time. So fast forward a few weeks. Nason is now working with Matt to develop a user experience design course for developers, which they ended up running at the hub and having 20 paid attendees. Nason and Mark are talking about possibly having Nason join the team as their lead CTO. We've hired Nason to build our own website. Nason is coming into the hub more pretty much on a daily basis. But by now, he's not only coming into the space to get work done, he's coming in because he has friends here, and he's expanding his client base, his scope of ideas, and he's also having constant conversations with other hub members about his own experiences about running an online startup, and he's giving advice to other members. During a conversation we were having one day, he tells me that he didn't expect this to happen. He talks about how he's realized that as he shifts his focus more towards building relationships, his own professional career prospers. He's made good friends, and he cares about the members around him and wants to help them too. So he ends up finding Jay a lead developer. He works on Matt's site for a while to get it to a point where they can actually hire a CTO. And finally, he ends up hiring Matt as a contract graphic designer for the company that he's now working on himself. So here's the point. Our members have a tough time being successful on their own. That's why they join the hub in the first place, because they're stuck in a rut usually. And in the process of trying to become successful when they join the hub, they create united groups. Those united groups with a coherent vision are what creates strong, vibrant community. In the process of trying to achieve their own visions, they create connections with others while still focusing on their own advancement. So as I mentioned earlier, we are in the business of growing community at the Hub. For us, growing a community directly correlates to our business model, because a stronger community means more member retention and more member sales. So we invest a lot of time and energy into growing our individuals as a whole. Here's what we've learned over the last couple of years in terms of how to build a vibrant community. So the first thing, number one, people need to have access to other individuals in order to help them. There's two different sides to this. One is that people need to meet other people who directly help them grow their business, like mentors, investors, developers, designers. For example, meet Rachel and Casey. Uh, Rachel and Casey are um, both co-founders of a company at the Hub called Community Source Capital, and they are a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform um, for small business loans. They're entrepreneurs at heart. They got their MBA at our neighbor upstairs, the Bainbridge Graduate Institute. Um, they've been working on this for a while. They came to the Hub because they needed to get out of the local coffee shop. They needed office space. At the Hub, they met members who helped them grow their business, everything from providing capital for their loans, um, helping out on having them apply for it to be a social purpose corporation, um, members who ended up investing in their company, and they also met members who helped um, with a pretty indirect approach, just by through random conversation. Um, Casey, for example, um, he's a pretty early riser. He usually gets to the hub around 7 a.m. every morning. Um, and through that, he meets Troy, who is also running a pretty successful internet startup. Um, they meet because they have a caffeine fix and they want coffee before any of the hosts are there to make coffee. So they end up having random conversations in the kitchen, just kind of talking through some things. Uh, Troy is actually an expert in um, peer-to-peer lending platforms, who would have guessed? And so through those conversations, Casey actually has built CSC's current clarity around lender messaging and disclosure, all for making a pot of coffee with Troy. But there's another side to having access to people that will help you. Not everyone is making companies, and, not, and starting a company shouldn't necessarily be what we're striving for or a measure of our success. Communities are not made up of people who just start things. Yes, ideas, new companies, these are important. What's even more important is making sure that people are, people are plugged into opportunities that utilize their personal skills and passions. And that comes in a lot of different ways. Like Karen. Karen is an amazing photographer, and she has a deep love for animals. Seriously deep, people. <laughs> 
She's been passionate about stopping animal abuse ever since she was a little girl. And she's been working on this animal abuse company um, when she first joined the Hub. And she was having a lot of trouble making it sustainable. Throughout a number of conversations with other members and investors, she realized that she was hitting a brick wall because she hated building a business. It just wasn't in her skill set. She launched her idea because she loved animals and she wanted to help them, but there's a lot of different ways to show that. We connected Karen with another animal rights organization, and she's currently working with them using her own skills, storytelling through photography to tell the story of the organization's mission. I don't think that I really need to tell you how important it is for a good photojournalist to help with telling the story of an animal rights activist organization. So the point is, it's not about starting your own business or not starting your own business. The point is providing opportunities for people to get into a state of flow, that single-minded focus and motivation that is so good for our souls. In order to build strong communities, you need to facilitate connections to others who can help each individual on a growth, growth trajectory within their own skill sets. Not everyone needs to be an entrepreneur to make a difference. We want to match people to with the project or person that most utilizes what they are good at. Number two, providing intentional space for deeper and meaningful conversation. The physical layout of a building really matters when you're thinking about interaction with different people. In Seattle, we have very limited public space, pretty much only parks. So that means that as city dwellers, we're only running into each other, basically hurrying to and from our work, our cars, our apartment buildings, and we're probably on our phone during, during that time. So the result of urban city dwelling and infrastructure is a sense of isolation, even when we're surrounded by thousands of different people. This isolation creates a yearning for human connection. This is even more exacerbated as we move into this freelance economy. Oh, I think over 15 million people um, are now uh, self-identified, self-employed, and working from home. So it's not news that ideas are not created by sitting by yourself in your home office. Ideas emerge in people of different backgrounds and different areas of expertise collide and share ideas. But in today's world, because of this urban isolation, it's hard to have those random interactions. Even if there was more public space to share conversations, there's another problem. We are control freaks. We like to control every aspect of our experience and interaction. And in today's technological world, our technology allows us to do that. When we can perfect an email, a text, or a chat before we send it out, that means that all of our human interactions can be very sterile. And the fact is that human relationships are messy, and we clean them up with technology. So in this isolated, carefully controlled world, we just don't have the types of random conversations that can lead to big, messy ideas. So how do you design space so individuals can have these deeper, meaningful conversations and collide in serendipitous connections? This is where the intention and the mission of the space is so important. Because as busy adults with a lot of information fatigue, we are so intentioned. We want to know that every single meeting, call that we take, has a goal and a purpose of where we're going and the conversations that we're going to have and basically how it's going to relate to our professional success. You can create just any old space, but if you want people to come to that space knowing that they're going to have random conversations in the kitchen or at the coffee bar, that space needs to have an a, a mission and an intention behind it. So that means that you are creating an environment that has a mission and reason behind it, so people know how to react and respond when they're coming, in, when they're coming inside. Because of our mission of random conversation at Impact Hub, people know why they're coming to the Hub, which means that they're open to the concept of random conversation because that's the culture that we're curating. So therefore, in a highly controlled world, with busier people, more technological devices, where random conversation just isn't as easy as it might have been. Strong relationships are formed when intentional space is provided for serendipitous connections and deeper, meaningful really, conversations. Number three, people need to feel like they belong to the community. This is really important. We go to places because we know that we share similar values with the people that are there. That sense of belonging is vital to feeling safe to share our opinions and ideas. Belonging also breeds a sense of responsibility to others in the community. The perception of exclusivity is really important here. New members need to apply to become members at Impact Hub, and when they're accepted, they're sent a welcome email from the entire team, letting them know that they've been accepted in, in, into the community. The email also reminds them what type of community we are building here at Impact Hub, and reinforces their decision that they belong here. 
when new members sign up, we also want them to realize that they are not just signing up for membership. Their, their involvement in this community is an active process. Their new member orientation, packet, and intake interview all underline this central theme of an active community. We want our members to know that their skills and interests are a necessary component to helping this community grow. And lastly, number four, individuals need to feel named. We are naturally very social creatures. Ever since the beginning of time, we have been going to places where, where others know our name, churches, bars. <laughs> we want to feel a part of something bigger than ourselves, and we want to feel named by others. As soon as new members walk into the space, they see their name written on a big welcome board. They're welcomed by a host into the space, giving co given coffee, tea, Wi-Fi, and a tour. Their picture's taken for the member wall, and their name is written on a note card that goes up as soon as they take their picture. So if they just happen to mosey on down to the member wall before they leave, they see their, their name on the wall among a, most of our other members, besides hundreds of, of other members. And that means instant community gratification. So with these four elements, you can create a pay-it-forward culture where everyone involved is invested in the overall community success. Building a strong community is not altruistic. You still need to focus on the individual needs and how these successes will advance the collective group as a whole. Even when you're striving for egalitarian goals, you need to balance that with individual needs. Thank you very much.